This horrifying photograph, captured on March 5, 1966, depicts the tragic final moments of BOAC Flight 911, what was one of the deadliest air disasters to have ever occurred at that time. Flying through the air isn't always a smooth journey. All airline passengers at some point or another have experienced turbulence. It's very common. Turbulence could occur any time and be bumpy, kind of like potholes in the sky. Planes, though, are extremely tough. For example, the materials used to make our modern passenger planes have made it so even the bumpiest of skies won't necessarily bring a plane down. But it wasn't always like that. As passengers today, it may be easy to forget that we now have over 100 years of aviation experience to draw from. Plenty of lessons have been learned about aviation safety in that time, many of them to do with the sky itself. This was one of those lessons. As turbulence is the topic of today's video, let's look at the accident of BOAC Flight 911. The British Overseas Airways Corporation was the state-owned national airline of the UK before the era of British Airways. Between the years of 1939 and 1974, the carrier transported people all over the world with their intercontinental fleet of aircraft. The accident in question took place in 1966. By the 1960s, the airline had acquired a number of jet aircraft, including the most popular passenger jet of its day, the Boeing 707. With this four-engine narrow-body jetliner, BOAC could reach the far extremities of the world much quicker than the prop liners that came before. Flight 911 was one of those flights, between London and Hong Kong. It was a multi-day journey that made numerous stopovers along the way, the first to Montreal, then San Francisco, thirdly Honolulu, followed by Tokyo, before the final leg to Hong Kong. March 4, 1966. The accident plane was due to land in Tokyo's Haneda Airport. This actually wasn't the accident flight. However, it was on this leg where things began to deviate from the schedule, of which the plane was running on time up till that point. The weather in Tokyo was very poor, with very limited visibility. The instrument landing system at the airport was also inoperative at the time. The pilots diverted the flight to Fukuoka for the night, until the following day where it would make its expected stop in Tokyo. I would be remiss if I neglected to mention that on that very day, the day the plane diverted, another fatal air accident took place at Tokyo. Canadian Pacific Airlines Flight 402 crashed at Tokyo Haneda. The Douglas DC-8 crashed into the seawall short of the runaway in poor visibility, leading to the deaths of 64 people. That is perhaps a story best saved for another day. March 5th, 1966, the following day. Flight 911 left Fukuoka for the short flight to Tokyo, where it arrived at 12.43 in the afternoon. The weather that day was much better. In fact, it was basically the opposite extreme compared to the day before. Weather fronts had moved in from the west and the skies were clear. In Tokyo, the plane would make its usual turnaround. Some passengers left and some boarded the flight for Hong Kong. Perhaps to throw in a bit of trivia, five highly notable passengers never turned up for the flight. As it turned out, those passengers were movie producers, Albert Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, best known for producing the early James Bond series of movies. They were touring Japan scouting for locations to shoot You Only Live Twice that would release the following year. Alongside the two was set designer Ken Adam, screenwriter Lewis Gilbert, and cinematographer Freddie Young. They cancelled their bookings on Flight 911 last minute to watch a ninja demonstration instead. At the flight controls of Flight 911 was 45-year-old Captain Bernard Dobson. As far as 707 pilots go, he was one of the most experienced of BOAC on this plane, having flown the aircraft for over six years by the time of the accident. He was very well versed in flying in and out of Tokyo. He was familiar with not only Haneda Airport, but also the surrounding area. We don't know as much about the other flight crew members. Their names were withheld from the public for one thing, 
but we do know that the first officer was a 33-year-old man who was also proficient on this plane, having logged just over 2,000 hours in the type. There were in fact two further men on the flight deck that day, a 33-year-old second officer and 31-year-old flight engineer, and again, neither of them were new to the plane. Upon reaching Tokyo, the pilots met with a dispatcher from BOAC, where the flight to Hong Kong was filed. After departure, the pilots were to bank the plane to the right and join an airway at Oshima, just a few miles from the airport. The new departure time of flight 911 from Tokyo was now 1.45. On time, the pilots communicated with air traffic control in Haneda and the engines were started. On board were 124 passengers and crew. At 1.58, flight 911 left the ground again at Tokyo. As a quick mention here, some documenting the crash of the Canadian Pacific plane the day before actually caught the accident BOAC flight on film as it taxied and took off. The passengers perhaps shocked as they caught a glimpse of the smoldering plane wreckage still on the ground. After takeoff as expected, the plane turned to the right. The plane's takeoff wouldn't actually be the only thing captured on film. As it turned out, there was a passenger sat in a window seat who possessed an 8mm film camera and was also capturing the departure on film. This film would eventually be found amongst the wreckage by investigators, and from that, they were able to not only plot where the plane flew, but also cross-reference that data with eyewitness statements and radar. It is likely that this passenger was taking the opportunity to capture aerial film footage of Fujiyama. The recovered film showed how the camera person captured the Japanese countryside as the plane climbed. Fujiyama, also known as Mount Fuji, is undoubtedly the most prominent geographical feature in this region. It's an active volcano and its presence dominates the landscape here. It is the tallest mountain in Japan. Flight 911 would soon fly over the small city of Gotemba, nearby to the mountain. It had become a feature of departures out of Tokyo that pilots would often treat their passengers to views of Fujiyama. To do this, pilots needed to deviate from their flight plans. It's something that Captain Dobson had done before as well. Passing over Gotemba City, the pilots turned the plane to a heading of about 300, a northwesterly heading towards the mountain. The plane's altitude at this point was climbing through 16,000 feet, with the pilots intending to level out at 17,000. The peak of Fujiyama stands at 12,388 feet. Flight 911 was well above the mountain, but it was an invisible killer that took the lives of 124 people that day, so let's break that down. On the plane's new heading, the 707 passed over the town of Takigahara, west of Gotemba. It was here that the plane began running into some problems. Suddenly, severe turbulence was being inflicted on the plane. Throughout that day, numerous other aircraft had reported severe turbulence around the mountain. A total of 79 other planes reported this turbulence within a regional radius of 150 kilometers from Fujiyama. Captain Dobson was well aware of the phenomenon of clear air turbulence and even expected it on this occasion. The way he understood it was that the contents of the reports from other aircraft contained no dangerous threat to his plane. He flew closer to the mountain and began a descent back down to 16,000. But let's take a look at that mountain for just a moment. A weather station positioned at the peak of Fujiyama recorded wind speeds reaching nearly 70 miles per hour. As the air passes over the mountain peak, the airflow is disrupted, creating a waving airflow that towers well above the mountain peak. We can call them mountain waves. The air also has a tendency to curl back in on the mountain itself, creating rotors of extremely turbulent air that spins around and around. These rotors of air are completely invisible, and pilots are warned that they can appear without warning. On that day in 1966, this effect could have been exacerbated further by the extreme change in weather in the preceding hours. Weather fronts moving in from the west, creating this region of turbulence on the mountain's east side. It was one of these rotors that Flight 911 flew into. The accident plane, upon reaching this turbulence, was hit with enough force that metal fatigue fracturing occurred in the key structural elements of the plane. Here is how the accident report puts it. 
It is presumed that the aircraft broke up in a very short period of time due to an abnormally high gust load and resulting high inertia force in excess of the design limit. One source suggests that some passengers were likely killed by the massive changes in gravitational forces brought on by the turbulence in this moment. Remember that passenger who was recording the Japanese countryside from their window seat? The recovered film when played back showed a skip of two frames at the time of disaster thought to be a result of a malfunction or jam in the camera's feeding mechanism, induced by the sudden jolt of the plane. If you're curious, the camera was panned to the cabin before it swiftly ended. It has never been publicly released. To get into a bit more detail, fractures occurred in multiple places. The outward section of the right wing was bent upward to the point of breaking. Investigators also found fracturing in the rear spar fitting on the right side of the tail fin, leading to a loss of the tail structure, following into a collapse of the horizontal stabilizers. As you'd expect, Captain Dobson flying the plane lost all control of his aircraft. The 707 pitched upward. Stresses on the airframe led to the failure of all four engine pylons. Given that it was a clear day and that there are many populated areas around Fujiyama, Thousands of people observed the plane plummeting to the ground, many noting a white vapor trailing from the plane. This was also observed in the numerous photographs taken. It is also clear from these photographs that the 707 entered a flat spin. The pilots, if they were even still alive at that point, had absolutely zero chance of recovering their plane. The aircraft's loss of control occurred in an instant from an invisible killer they didn't know was there. The lives of 124 people were lost alongside the plane. BOAC Flight 911 was, at the time, one of the deadliest air disasters to have ever occurred. At the time, the effects of strong turbulence caused by mountain waves was not very well understood. The technological limitations of the 1960s left a lot to be desired in this field of research. The investigation prompted a closer look at the phenomenon. The sightseeing aspect of this disaster can't really be overlooked. The pilots deviated from their original flight plan and flew too close to the mountain. Lessons learned from this accident have helped keep millions of passengers safe throughout the decades. We now know so much more about meteorology than we ever could have imagined at the dawn of the jet age. Airplanes are physically made stronger to withstand immense forces. That flexing of the wings you may see on your own journeys in turbulence is a completely intended feature that allows the wings to absorb extreme loads, just to give an example. The crash of the BOAC plane really brought the dangers of clear air turbulence and mountain waves to the forefront of aviation safety. And while the danger still lurks out there invisible, pilots are all too aware of the danger posed by the mountains. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. When I set out to make this video, I was rather surprised at the lack of coverage of this accident. It's a truly fascinating yet horrifying story with extremely ominous surrounding circumstances. If it's any consolation to anyone, I believe that there actually hasn't been an accident of this magnitude in relation to mountain turbulence since the BOAC incident. Unless you can think of one, be sure to let me know in the comments below. Anyway, I will not keep this outro too long because I've got a sore throat and stuffy nose, which is why I may have sounded a little different in this video. A massive thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for their amazing support. Their names are on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a massive thanks to you. Shout out this week to Hierarchy Anarchy, who pledged at the highest tier. What a legend. Thank you so much. If you yourself want to support the channel further, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes up publicly on YouTube. And that is where I'm going to end the video right now. If you want to follow my personal Twitter, that too will be linked in the pinned comment. Otherwise, have a great day and I will see you next week. Goodbye!